you have your Bibles, you can open them to Jude chapter 1. Verse 3. Jude is writing, and he writes these words. He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message this morning. Lord, we just come and we do thank you for the great privilege we have of being here today. We thank you that we can worship you in song. We thank you now as we worship you through your word. We pray that you will speak into our hearts and into our lives, I pray. And Lord, then as we gather around your table, that you would uh, just allow us to fellowship with you in your communion, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I have to confess that I am finding this to be a very challenging message to preach. There's, every once in a while, you have a message that you just say, yeah, I really should have somebody else come and preach this message for me. Uh, in this case, I probably should have a Presbyterian come and preach this message this morning. Uh, certainly not a Baptist. The uh, title for the message this morning is Baptist Persecution theology, and man-made traditions. And so if you are visiting with us this morning, um, we don't normally spend a lot of time hailing Baptist um, traditions and Baptist, um, you know, saying, well, we're so wonderful and so great. But today I'm going to be doing that. Uh, and that's where I feel a little bit kind of awkward about the whole thing, being that I am a Baptist. But the reason for that is because we're starting a new series starting today, and the series is going to run for the entire summer. It's called You Asked For It. And so this is, comes out of the You Asked For It. And so I'm just going to get into my notes here. Killing Baptists was cool in the day. That uh, day may come back sometime. Baptists have always dared to stand apart, to be different, to march to a different drum. We have a history as Baptists to not follow the trend theologically as well as morally and socially. And that tradition goes way back, farther than a lot of people would even consider. Again, this new series that we have started, you asked for it. I have the card here with me. And so if you remember, we'd put these out there and you could write topics on there. And out of that, we have three questions. And those are the three questions I'm going to be dealing with this morning. The first one is, what did, uh, why did the Protestants persecute Baptists back in the day? The second question is, why do Baptists embrace uh, uh, reform theology, thinking of if the Protestants persecuted the Baptists, why did we as Baptists now embrace the very theology of the people who persecuted us? And then the third question, what are man-made traditions within the Baptist church? And so we're going to look at those. Um, and, and I... I quoted this verse here, and, and I told my wife, I'm going to do something I hate doing. It's called springboarding. It's where you quote a verse, and then you don't even deal with the verse. We, we, we are going to deal with the verse, briefly, from the standpoint that uh, clearly we're called to contend earnestly for the faith that was once passed down for to us. And what we're going to see is that there were groups of people down through church history that have consistently and always contended earnestly for the faith that was hand it down to them. And we're going to look at that today. Now I have to start by saying that I am a bit biased. I was raised in the Baptist church. I was born, I believe, on a Sunday and I was in church the next Sunday in Cambridge, Ontario in a Baptist church. And that's been my life. I have not been part of a non-Baptist church for my entire life. On top of that, my mother was raised in a Baptist church over in the Netherlands. And my mother's father was raised in a Baptist church over in the Netherlands, making her uh, his parents, my, my mother's grandparents, uh, to be Baptists in a day in which it was cruel to kill Baptists. And so they definitely ran the risk of being killed for their faith as Baptists in the Netherlands. 
I am a Baptist pastor because I believe that the way we as Baptists do church is the most biblical way. I don't apologize for that. I absolutely believe that. If I thought that there was another church that was doing it more biblical than we are, that's where I would be. Because I'm committed to the Word of God and the Word of God first and foremost. This may again feel like an us versus them message, and it's not intended to be that way. If it sounds that way, I apologize for that right now. That is not my goal. I believe that the Lord has his children scattered throughout the church. In every denomination, there are those who know and love Jesus Christ, and it's been that way and been true down through the centuries. But this morning is going to be a bit on the Baptist side. So if you're not Baptist, if you come from a different background, you may feel a little uncomfortable this morning. And you may feel those Baptists think an awful lot about themselves. And I apologize for that. But somebody wrote these questions. And as we went through them, it's like, well, who's going to deal with those? I got elected to do that. So it was nice of Mark and Enza to let me do this. One of the things that is interesting, we just celebrated 150 years of Canada. Baptists have been involved in Canada for over 200 years. In fact, there's a little church in a little town called Sawyerville, Quebec. My wife, as a child, attended that church after her family came to faith in Christ. That church is considered to be, if not the oldest Baptist church in Canada, the second oldest Baptist church in Canada. It's over 200 years old. Still going strong for the Lord. It was always an English church, but just recently they have actually become a bilingual church. And so they have an English service, they have a French service, and occasionally they have a bilingual service. So where they have everybody together. So they're continuing to go strong in their community. And so, and that's one of our fellowship churches, actually. So if you're not familiar with us, we're a fellowship Baptist church. We're part of 500, about 500 churches across Canada, about 300 churches in Ontario and English-speaking Quebec. And then we have a lot of churches in Quebec, a lot of churches out in BC. We have a few scattered in the prairies, and we have a few down east. And so that's kind of where our base is. So why was killing Baptists cool back in the day? And that's a good question. I'm going to use an article from baptistbasics.org slash baptist slash b007. So if you want to look it up, you can look it up. It's up there. You can write that down. You can go and you can get this article yourself. Many Baptists are very particular. Now, this is the article, so this is not my words. I'm sharing these points with you. I'll tell you when I come to an end of this article. Many Baptists are very particular about which terms they uh, use to apply to themselves. They often shun such labels as evangelical or ecumenical. Uh, definitely unfamiliar with the not being ecumenical. Um, the evangelical, I get that some of them would say, no, we're fundamental, not evangelical, because evangelicalism today has definitely been watered down. One term that is often used to describe Baptist is Protestant. And so we've been called Protestants. But we need to look at the question, are we as Baptists Protestants? And, and I have to confess, I do not believe that Baptists are Protestants. Uh, and, and so this article, I believe, restates that. And I've got two other little booklets. If you want to borrow them, you can. That would help you understand a little bit more about why I would say that we are not Protestants. First, let's define what a Protestant is. The Protestant movement began during the time of the Reformation in about the 1500s. These groups protested certain doctrines and practices in the Catholic Church. Among things uh, they protested uh, were the sale of in indulgence, um, salvation by works, and papal authority. At first, most of these groups sought to reform the Catholic Church, and so they were never intending to leave the Catholic Church. Luther was not intending to leave the Catholic Church. Calvin was not intending to leave the Catholic Church. Okay? Zwingli was not intending to leave the Catholic Church. These were Catholic priests within the Catholic Church that were intending to reform the Catholic Church from within. That was their goal. 
That was their desire. Not to create another movement, but to reform the church from within. A couple of groups that can truly be called Protestants, of course, would be the Lutherans. They began under the leadership and direction of Luther. The uh, Episcopalians, uh, they began with Henry VIII, and of course their reason for becoming a church was very interesting. Henry VIII had a wife that he did not like because she could not get pregnant, and he wanted to divorce her, and he wanted to get remarried, and the Pope would not grant him the privilege of being getting divorced from her. She was one of the lucky ones because he'd killed all the others. So I, she, he must have really loved her. That he'd rather divorce her rather than kill her. Whatever the case, when he realized that the Pope was not going to give him permission, he said, okay, fully on the Pope. I should have as king authority myself to make that decision. And so he separated the Church of England from the Roman Church and became the Church of England or the Anglican Church today. And so that's the starting point of that quote-unquote reformation. Really, not as much of a reformation as just a separation. And they, of course, have stepped away from a few things, Catholic, but not many. These, the, uh, Calvin is believed to be the father of the uh, Presbyterian movement. Okay, And these groups are truly what we would refer to as Protestant. They were Catholics, and they protested against Catholic teaching, and because of that, they left the Catholic Church, because they could not reform the Catholic Church, they stepped out of the Catholic Church, and they created their own denomination. Now, Baptists have a long heritage of disagreeing with the Catholic Church. You know, we don't agree with them on their hierarchy, uh, we don't agree with them on you know many of their doctrines. Uh, they spoke out against such errors that had entered into the, uh, into that growing organization uh, as baptismal regeneration. Baptismal regeneration was a theology that had entered the church before infant baptism entered the church. And so baptism of regeneration is basically that through baptism a person becomes a Christian becomes born again. That baptism is more than just a symbol. That baptism actually has the ability to regenerate somebody. And that is a heresy. The Bible is very clear on that. It is by faith and faith alone that we are saved, not by works. And if baptism is the ability and has the ability to wash away our sins, then baptism becomes a work. And so Baptists stood against that eventually the church then moved to infant baptism because they came to the conclusion if baptism washes away sin then what we need to do is we need to baptize babies because if what happens if they die before they get to the place of getting baptized then they're going to be lost and so we baptize babies and then this split came between the Greek Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church because the Greek Orthodox Church continues to this day to immerse babies baptizing them, immersing them. That was the original way in which it was done with infants, not sprinkling them. And the Catholic Church then moved to sprinkling them. Although those Baptists have uh, disagreed with the Roman, uh, they have never been a part of the Roman Catholic Church. And this is where the issue of Protestant, calling Baptists Protestants, comes into question. They were never part of the Catholic Church. Nowhere in their history can they be found to be part of or in alliance with the Church of Rome. They have always been independent. He continues on, and, and this is a, maybe a, sounds like a harsh statement, and this is his statement, and I'm sharing it with you. He said, I heard once, and, and his own response was, I felt, what I felt was an outrageous statement. So this is this outrageous statement. If you take all the Baptist doctrines out of the Protestant church, then you only have Catholic doctrines left. So if you look at the Lutheran church, you look at the Anglican church, you look at the Presbyterian church, you look at any church that comes out of the Reformation and you remove the theology that we as Baptists hold dear, what you're left with is Catholic theology. In other words, they all have brought with them their Catholic theology. 
And, and I want to state very clearly here. I am not saying that they are not churches, that they don't love the Lord, that they're not committed to the Lord. I'm not saying that there aren't Christians amongst them. Absolutely there are. But what we're talking here is about their organization, their church as an organization versus Baptist church as an organization. And when I say Baptist, we're talking Anabaptist, so that really does include, I believe, the Mennonites, the Baptist, and really the Brethren kind of fall into that same category. We all kind of have the similar roots. And that's significant to understand that. It's not just, you know, the Baptist, but it's, it's groups that hold to biblical theology and have always held to biblical theology down through history. And so his statement, if you take all the Baptist doctrine out of a Protestant church, then you are only left with Catholic doctrine left. And, 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 and here's a significant thing. When you look at a Baptist church, if you take all of the basically what would separate Protestants from Catholics, if you took all of those doctrines out of us, we'd have nothing left. And that's significant. That's, that's the, I would say, the big difference between a Baptist and a Protestant. He goes on, he goes, says, therefore, let me say that I personally feel that the term Protestant should not be uh, used to describe Baptist. We have never been in accord with the Pope of Rome. Our, uh, our lineage has to be followed back before the Church of Rome began. And, and again, there, there is evidence that before you would have what we would know, to know today as the Church of Rome, there were groups who held true to what we hold true to today down through history. And we're going to look at that. Now, if you wish to throw out the, tr the historic meaning of Protestant and say anybody that's not Catholic is Protestant, then yes, I guess we would fall into that category as Protestant. We're clearly not Catholic. But he goes on to say that that is a tremendous stretch and he would prefer rather to use Baptist than non-Baptist. And that's the end of the quote. So I don't know how you f feel with that, but, you know, it, it's interesting when you think about this whole thing of history. History is a very interesting thing because it all depends on who wrote it as to who's going to shine and who's not going to shine, right? And, and a lot of history was not written, church history was not written by Baptist, okay? And so looking for the Baptist history, you have to really kind of be very careful and look in very great detail. Um, Baptists were fair game because of their theology, their biblical authority. The Bible is the final authority on all matters. We do not ascribe to um, any type of creed. If there is a creed, and there are some times where we will say, well, this is a creed that we think really expresses well what we believe, that's fun and dandy, but the creed itself never, never has authority if it contradicts the Word of God. When I came here to Lansing, we had certain things in our statement of faith. And as time went on, we said, you know what? We, I can see where some people would say that. But, but really, we can't firmly teach that from the scriptures. It's in our statement of faith. But our statement of faith needs to change. And it did change. Why? Because the Word of God is the final authority. Not our statement of faith, not our constitution, not the way we do business, but the Word of God is the final authority. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 through 16 talks about the importance of the Word of God. And it's the Word of God is the final authority. Peter talks about the fact that the Word of God in 1 Peter chapter 20, the ch sorry, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, that Scripture comes from God and is not open to private interpretation. So we cannot just make it say what we want it to say. We need to be faithful to the Word of God. The second reason, the second theology that we as a, a Baptist held to and, and have held to is the autonomy of the local church. The local church is an independent body accountable to Jesus Christ himself as the head. He, we're not accountable to Feb Central. We're part of Feb Central. But Feb Central, which is an office down in Toronto, they represent us. We don't represent them. They have no authority over us. We, in fact, have authority over them. And so we as a local church, and, and that's why you'll find if you are been part of the Baptist church for any length of time, it is interesting you can go into a Baptist church, a Fellowship Baptist church here in Sudbury, and then go into a Fellowship Baptist church somewhere else, and they can be very different 
And the reason is because we're independent. And everything that is done here locally, the finances are raised here locally for that. We don't get money from anywhere else. And we also get nobody telling us what we can and cannot do. We are under the authority of the Word of God and under the authority of Christ. And so the way we as Baptists function is basically the members in the end have the final authority when it comes to how we do and what we do and if we buy or if we sell and all that kind of stuff and what, organ what programs we run and all that kind of stuff. The priesthood of all believers. And again, this is another one. First uh, Peter chapter 2 verses 5 and 9. Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10. And we believe in the priesthood of all believers. That was something very different. We do not have a hierarchy. And yes, we did ordain Pastor Inza, and he's now the Reverend Inza Fleetstra. And Pastor Mark is the Reverend Mark Smith, and I'm the Reverend Jack Fleetstra. But guess what? Do you ever hear somebody calling us that? People don't even call me pastor, and that's perfectly okay. Because guess what? If my name, Jack, was good enough for my mom, it's good enough for you. And I am not above you. And Mark and Eans are not above you. We are with you. We are together in ministry, together in service. And that's one of the things that set the Baptist Church apart down through the centuries, is the fact that the pastors were not clergy. Now, out in the public, sometimes we will use our title because it gives us some benefits to help in dealing with people. Because when you're dealing with them and you say, oh, I'm Pastor Jack from Leslie, they look at you kind of like, oh, you're just, uh, you know. But when you say, I'm the Reverend Jack Fleetstra, then all of a sudden they understand my position, my role, and then there is a certain amount of respect that comes with that, particularly when I'm going into the hospital or going into the city hall and stuff like that. But again, that's used very, very seldom and only where it's applicable for the sense of being able to say, you know, I am a, position, I am a person of authority here. But understand that the priesthood of all believers is that we believe that every person is responsible before God. And every person has access to God themselves. The two ordinances, the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And again, within Baptist circles, there definitely have been those who would say that baptism has to be occur before you can take the Lord's Supper. There are Baptists who say, no, that's not the case. And here, here we don't police the Lord's Supper. If you are a child of God seeking and to live in obedience to him, then you're commanded to take part in that. It's an ordinance, not a sacrament. And that's one of the things that separates us from the Protestants. They have sacraments. We do not. Sacraments are means by which we bestow God's grace upon someone. It's a way in which we get God's grace. An ordinance is simply an act of obedience because we've been ordered, we've been commanded to do so. Individual soul liberty is another thing that separates Baptists from the Protestants and from the Roman Catholics. And that was one of the big ones that caused the persecution to happen. One of the big ones was soul liberty. So the, 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 the ones that were the really big things that caused the Baptists down through the history to be persecuted by first the Catholics and then the Protestants. And I have to say, during the Reformations, the, the Baptists came out of hiding, thinking that they had finally found an ally in the Protestants because a lot of the doctrines that the Baptists believed, these guys had now embraced. And we'll talk about that, if I still have time. And... Um, Anyways, basically, the three things were the mode of baptism, the fact that you have to be baptized as a believer upon your profession of faith by immersion, the uh, individual soul liberty. Those two in particular were things that caused the church to say, no, we cannot accept that. And so soul liberty is basically the belief that every person has the right to believe what they want to believe. And we're not going to impose that. State churches, on the other hand, would impose, you have to believe as we believe, and that's where the persecution came in. If you did not believe as we believe, then you would be persecuted. Baptists in the Netherlands had been approached by the, I think, then king of the Netherlands to become the state church of the Netherlands, and they refused. 
And one of the reasons would have been because of this issue of individual soul liberty. The liberty to stand before God and give an account for themselves as to why they chose to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there was no forcing uh, and no persecution for not believing as we believe. Saved, baptized church membership was another thing that separates us. You have to be saved and baptized to become a member of the church. And then two offices, the fact that you have elders and deacons. Um, most historically, Baptists had the pastor was the elder, and then you had deacons. I would say only in recent years that we've had a plurality of elders and, and deacons, and some elders who were not pastors. But that has only been within the last maybe 15 to 20 years that we really start to see that happening in Baptist circles. And we have that here at Lansing. And I very much uh, am in favor with that. Separation of church and state, and that was another thing that really caused the Baptists a lot of grief down through history. We believe that the church is not to be tied to the state. Yes, as Christians, in a free society, we should vote. You want to run for office? Run for office. But we as a church, you will never hear me preach and tell you how to vote. You will never hear me even tell you how I vote. Because it's none of your business. And it doesn't belong here. What belongs here is the Word of God, and that's what we need to teach and preach. And so, separation of church and state. So those are the reasons why they were persecuted. Then we come to that second uh, question about theology. So, you know, why did the Baptist embrace um, Protestant theology? Or did they? So where do the Reformers get their non-Catholic thinking from? I don't know if you've given that any thought or not. And, and again, today is more of like a lecture than a sermon, and I apologize for that. But we're dealing with a lot of church history here today. Again, history is a funny thing. It's not as cut and dry as people sometimes make it out to be. Many see church history in this way. Early church morphs into Roman Catholic or into Catholic church that then divides in around 900 AD into the Roman Catholic church and the Greek Orthodox church. And then the Reformation starts in around 1500, 1600 with Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. And then out of them comes the Anabaptists and then eventually Baptist groups. And so you've got, out of the Anabaptists, you've got the Mennonites. You would have, I believe, and I haven't really checked this out, but I would assume that the brethren would say that they've come out of that group as well. And then, of course, Baptists have come out of that group as well. And so basically that's how people see church history. You have the early church that Christ established. It morphs into the Catholic church. You have that first division. Then you have multiple divisions. And then out of that comes what we today would refer to as Baptist. But what is interesting, and I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to go real fast here. In 300, uh, between 300 and 305 AD, you have the, a gentleman named uh, Donatus. And Donatus, he established a group called the uh, Don, Donat, Donatites, or Donatism. And the Donatism, they were a group who literally believed what we believe. That's 300 years after Christ. So this is before the Catholic Church was established, before the Roman Catholic Church was established. This group was already there. They are referred by, considered by many scholars as the forerunners of the Anabaptists and the Radical Reformation of the 1600s. So these guys existed long before the Reformation took place. They existed alongside the, the official church of the day, they would have met in small groups. They would have been teaching the Word of God, been committed to the things of the Word of God, and never forsaken that. Continued to hang on to the faith once delivered. And then in 1100, so still well before the Reformation, you have a group called the Waldens. And the Waldens, or the Valdens, depending on the translation, uh, it can either start with a W or with a V. It probably with a V, but the V in the Dutch language is often pronounced like a W, so that's where the confusion may have come in that. This group, um, many of them ended up uh, migrating to England. And uh, they came into England. They were uh, not allowing for their children to be baptized. They were anti-infant uh, baptism. And so both the, the, um, the 
Papists or the, 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 you know, the Catholics and the Protestants at that time, although the Protestants really approved of their lifestyle, they also considered them to be Baptist in their teaching. And William of Newbury, he said of the world ends, that uh, they detest they, they detested holy baptism, which is again infant baptism, and they were as numerous as the sand. So there was lots of them. People who were committed to the word of God and not following into and following with the teachings of the church of that day. That's 1100, so that's still 400 years before the Reformation took place. And between the 300 and the, and the 1100, there's multiple groups there that we could look at that also continue to hold to some of the very basic teachings that we hold to. In 1395, we have a group called the Lollards, and they adopted the beliefs of Wycliffe and John Huss, both who were put to death, and their ministry, uh, and their own ministry, and, uh, and were winning popular support. It is true they denied infant baptism and believed that the main task of a priest was to preach, Moreover, that everyone should have access to a Bible in their own language, but the denial of infant baptism more than, uh, than the Baptist faith was seen as a great heresy. This is all before the Reformation. These people were committed to the Word of God, committed to biblical truth, before the Reformation ever happened. Now that's significant. Because that raises the question, who influenced the influencers? Who influenced the influencers? We know that before the Reformation, there were people who embraced biblical theology. We know that Calvin married an Anabaptist. I don't know if you knew that or not. Calvin's wife was a widow. She'd been married to an Anabaptist pastor. And she was widowed. And Calvin ended up marrying her. And he speaks very highly of her and the influence that she had in his life. Recording that statement that I said earlier from that gentleman who said, you know, this is a little bit of a disturbing statement, but I think it's something to can really consider, and that is, if you take all the Baptist or if you take all the biblical doctrine out of Protestant churches, then you will only have Catholic doctrine left. What seems to have happened is that is not that Baptists embraced Protestant theology, but that in fact Protestants embraced Baptist theology and biblical theology. And then along the way, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and these guys were actually influenced by these small groups and pockets of people who were faithful to the Word of God down through the history of the church. So where did the confusion come from? The theology that the reformers taught did not start with them. They did not get a new idea. And I know that we're going to celebrate the Reformation in the fall, and I think it's very appropriate for us to celebrate the Reformation in the fall and to celebrate these very biblical truths that the Reformation brought forward. But it's important to understand that down through church history, there have always been groups who have held on to the five solas. The Reformation brought forth the five solas. The five solas are scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And it is a fantastic thing that that was propagated very clearly through the Reformation, but it didn't start there. There were groups of people who were true to the word of God that held true to those teachings and the beliefs of the five solas down through the histories. We have a group that I've mentioned already in 300 AD, group in 1100 AD, a group in 1300 AD. We have groups that have been down through the history that have held to these very basic truths of the scriptures. So what happened in the Reformation? I believe, and again you can dispute with me, and that's okay, and there are many who would, and many who are way wiser than I that would say, Jack, you're out to lunch here. And I know many have accepted the fact that Baptists have just come out of the Protestant church. I do not. I think there's enough evidence to show that we didn't. 
But what I believe did happen is that the reformers had a platform the Anabaptists did not have. I don't know if you knew this, but the Anabaptists were forbidden to attend schools of higher learning. If you were not sprinkled as a baby in the official church of the state, you could not go to a school of higher learning. You had to have proof that you were christened as a baby into the Anglican faith if you were in England and other, congr other churches in other places. And if you didn't have that, you could not go. So you have Anabaptists. And it's interesting, down through the history, when you read some of the stuff, and I'm way out of time. If you read some of the stuff about that, what we'll find is, is that there were people who would dispute with the Anabaptists and with the Baptists about theology, and they were blown away because these Preachers had never gone to Bible college, had never had any formal training, and they would out teach and out dispute and out argue men with doctorates in theology. Because they had the Word of God. And they were committed to the Word of God. And there's no getting around that. My last main point dealing with the third question is this. What tradition should we as Baptists shed? Do we as Baptists have man-made traditions that are unique to Baptists? In short, the answer is no, we do not. No, we don't. We, we literally don't. I have, I have searched. I've talked to other pastors who said, what are man-made traditions that we as Baptists have that are, that are us? That, that, that says, this is a Baptist tradition. I mean, we worship... We worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday. That's a man-made tradition. It is. But that's not traditional to us. That, that's true for every church. But meeting together on the first day of the week is not man-made. That's biblical. Um, the order of our service is man-made. That's true. There's no way that says we have to sing three songs and then have the kids come up and then do this. That's man-made for sure. But the fact that we do our service and what we do in our service is not man-made. We see throughout Scripture, singing and preaching and praying and all of the things that we do in a service are all straight from the Word of God. We have children's programs. That's man-made. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to have a children's program on Sunday morning for the kids. But what we do, you know, teaching the children, that is not man-made. We're told in Scripture to teach our children. We, use, uh, we used to have Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Both of those are man-made. We used to have rules about smoking and drinking and dancing and going to movies. Those are all man-made. The way we do uh, membership is man-made. But the concept of membership is not man-made. So in fact, the, you know, the way we do it as a Baptist church where you have to talk to two of the elders and then give your testimony or answer three questions and have the church vote, that's man-made. We get that. But the concept of being a member is not man-made. See, man-made would be anything that we do that is not explicitly taught in Scripture. And so, yeah, there are some things that we do that are not explicitly taught in Scripture. But they're not harmful to the body of Christ. So why did the Protestants persecute Baptists back in the day? Because of our commitment to biblical theology. Why do Baptists embrace Reformed theology, particularly Calvinism? We didn't. We influenced the reformers. What are man-made traditions in Baptist church? None that would harm, that would be harmful to the work of God. So then the question is, what do we do with this? This is an odd sermon, I know. What do you do with this? First of all, rejoice in our history. We have a long history. We really do. In Canada alone, our history is over 200 years old. And, and literally, and I mean, it, there are some books that want to trace us right back to Christ. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. That really doesn't matter. But there's always been people who have been committed to the Word of God. And that's the final. Hold on to the faith once delivered to us. Let's pray. Lord, we just come and we do thank you for this opportunity to look at our history and to reflect upon it from and in your Word of God and to recognize that you've called us to something very precious. And Lord, I pray that we would not take that for granted, that we would recognize that by your grace, we are where we are today. May we be faithful to holding forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And we recognize that the most important thing of this whole message is that we want to be a people who, are, who accept the authority of Scripture and nothing else. And that our faith is in Christ and Christ alone. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.